Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, my apologies for any of the technical issues there. I think we hit the record button a little bit too soon, uh, but not to worry. Um, excited to have everyone here today, um, and I hope uh, hope you're enjoying the nice spring weather, um, albeit within your, your, your five kilometer radius. Um, I guess, um, welcome, first of all. Um, some of us, uh, some of you there are, are, are existing customers, and, and, and thank you for, for joining us and, and taking the time out today. And for people who don't know Action Point, um, I'll give you a brief background on, on uh, what we do and uh, why we're doing this event in a little bit. Um, so I guess, look, the, the topic of today's event is all around public sector technology planning, uh, with a particular focus on the OGP frameworks. Um, and I guess what we want to do, we, we're responding to, I suppose, customer feedback. Um, the, the OGP frameworks were released in November um, with some key changes um, from the last framework, which was 2016. So I think we kind of, uh, gather together and kind of um, uh, uh, exchange some ideas on, on what it is we could do. So this is very much an information session around the OGP framework. But I also want to kind of tip our hat to, I suppose, the extraordinary year that, um, that was last year with the pandemic um, and some of the technology trends that I think should help um, shape your planning um, over the next year and over the next five years, really. Um, so just a brief recap on the agenda. Um, so. This is, uh, I'm just going to give you a big brief background on action point and what it is uh, that we do. Um, I'll also introduce our speakers um, in just a little bit as well. Jonathan Dean um, will take us through some public sector digital transformation trends. Um, some very, very interesting research um, that he's carried out there um, to really try and shape, hopefully, the narrative and technology decisions going forward over the next five years. Um, Greg Costello, our public sector lead, is up next, um, and he's going to dig into the nitty gritty, really, um, of the OGP frameworks and um, with particular focus on lot five um, and some of the interesting um, ramifications um, of that change in, in, in framework. Um, after all that, um, we're going to um, introduce our, our other guest speaker, uh, Ross Kerr from Dell Technologies, um, and he's going to join our panel. Uh, and, and hopefully uh, the goal is really to, to really focus on that Q&A section. Um, if there's any questions or concerns that you have about the frameworks or any clarifications you need, uh, please use that segment um, to your advantage. Um, I suppose for people who don't know us, um, here's a bit of a background on Action Point. Um, I suppose our, our mission is to help companies achieve their greatest potential using the power of technology. Um, we, our business is kind of broken down into three key strands. So consultancy advice, which is the umbrella um, over which we, we deliver our managed IT services and custom software development. Um, and essentially, it's this broad-based skill set that has probably um, made us an attractive supplier for public sector organizations undergoing digital transformation, either at an infrastructure level or at the ICT level. Um, a bit of background on our public sector track record. Um, it is one of our highest growing segments in the business. Um, we have had um, we, we, we have had some success, a lot of successful project deliveries since we started and joined the OGP framework um, in 2016. As I said, we're, we're delivering across both ICT and infrastructure, and we're very comfortable having both of those conversations. So um, as a follow up after the, the webinar, um, please do you know, let us know um, how we can help and, and how we can help better plan your tender. Um, I guess within the infrastructure uh, space, we're a Dell Platinum partner um, and have uh, significant success in delivering um, infrastructure projects um, for both county councils, uh, city councils, and larger public sector bodies as well. Um, our public sector lead, Greg, reminds me that we were one of the only vendors who delivered hyperconverged infrastructure during the last OGP framework. Um, and a key part of, of what we're going to talk about today will be that area. We'll touch on it, we'll touch on it briefly, um, but it's something that's going to come uh, in, in a future event as well. But it's just to flag it there. Um, and um, yeah, so, so that's kind of our public track, or track record. Um, I guess, you know, projects do the talking uh, ultimately. And I just wanted to spotlight one project. It's an ICT focused one. Um, it was the Department of Foreign Affairs. Um, and the passport office project that we delivered. Um, and ultimately, the Department of Foreign Affairs wanted to um, fully digitalize um, the passport renewal process and the passport application process. And it's an interesting project in that it was a, it was, it was a multi-phase project. Um, you know, we started looking at this in 2016 um, with the first project delivery on St. Patrick's Day in 2017. Now, there's been subsequent updates on that. So initially, it was just passport renewals for adults. Then we brought in child renewals and then we brought in first time applicants in, in, in three subsequent changes. And it's a really great case study in how the department has approached change management um, and reform 
um, and ultimately how they've um, they've opened their door to enable technology um, to to deliver um, on that vision. A um, couple of key results: um, almost 45% of all passports are now renewed online. Um, this is especially important as 2018 and 2019 were all record years for the passport office due to Brexit and other factors. There's over 900,000 um, passports processed. Um, I think one of the interesting stats that we kind of learned recently was, was the number of passports that were still delivered in 2020. So a lot of public sector departments would have closed their, their physical branches or their customer touch points, um, whereas the passport officer was still able to deliver 400,000 passports. Now, obviously, it's reduced demand and all that stuff, but it's still a significant number, um, almost half of the total um, of 2019. Um, I guess the, the, the real proof of the pudding is in the delivery time. Um, from when you submit a form, um, on the passport office website, um, you upload your picture to when you get the physical passport through the post box. Um, it's between three and seven days. Um, and we've heard anecdotes of people in Paris and Boston getting uh, achieving that time frame as well, um, less than four days. Uh, so it's just it's just incredible how well the technology has worked um, and how focused the department was in improving a very manual and labor intensive process. Um, the department itself has won a world class civil service award um, in 2020 and has also won numerous uh, customer experience awards as well. Um, so again, just a very exciting project that we're very proud to be a part of. Um, I'm going to run, I just want to gather, I guess I want to get a feel for, um, you know, where you are in your tender journey a little bit. Uh, so I'm just going to launch that poll and give you a couple of seconds to uh, answer it, if you wouldn't mind. <clears throat> So the poll is that uh, when's your organization next planning on going to tender? Um, uh, currently in pro tendering process, one to three months, four to six months, six to 12 months, and 12 plus months. So um, yeah, please uh, please give us your feedback there. It'll make for some interesting uh, content for Q&A a little bit later. Perfect, just gonna end that poll there now. Um, so next up, I'm going to actually invite our speakers on. So uh, Ross, Jonathan, and Greg, if you'd like to flick on your cameras and um, we'll do some speaker introductions. Hello. Excellent, excellent. Um, so I suppose uh, reverse order, um, Ross, would you like to introduce yourself and give us a little bit of your background? Yeah, no problem. Um, hi, everybody. Um, for those who don't know, I'm Ross Kerr. I manage the relationship between Dell Technologies, local government semi-tastes and some central government departments. Um, my responsibility in Dell covers the complete end-to-end -end Dell Technologies portfolio. So I would manage um, VMware to storage arrays to mice and everything in between. Um, I suppose <clears throat> in the good old days pre-COVID, our engagement model is very much one of a face-to-face -face engagement uh, where we like to take more of an outcomes-based approach with our uh, discussions with our public customers. What that means is we really want to understand what you want to achieve, how you want to achieve it, and that could be cloud, hybrid cloud, on-premise. Uh, we don't really want to just throw product at our customers. Um, we're probably, well, we are actually the only OEM remaining who can take that holistic look um, from the edge to the core to the cloud. I suppose historically, we would have had a very much direct engagement model, which we still retain a little bit, I suppose, for end user devices. But within public sector, 90% of our solutions are, well, well, certainly on my base, my solutions would be sold via channel partners such as Action Point. And we have a great relationship with the uh, our partner network through enabling and facilitating them to set our portfolio. Thank you very much, Ross. Looking forward to hearing more from you uh, in the panel discussion a little later today. Um, over to you, Greg. Thanks, Peter. Um, good morning or good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome. Good to see uh, a couple of familiar names in the attendee list there. Um, my name is Greg Costello, and I'm Enterprise Business Development Manager with Action Point. I've been for my sins in the IT industry for 30 odd years now, having worked in Ireland, the UK and the USA uh, in, range, in roles ranging from software development, IS management, project management, and most recently IT solution sales. I got involved in the whole public tender space back in 2015 
uh, when Action Point teamed up with, with Dell as the OEM uh, for the first iteration of the OGP framework, the current framework that we're, we're going to be talking today. In the interim, as Peter said, we've enjoyed uh, numerous mini competition successes and we continue to increase our presence uh, and look to increase our presence uh, in that whole OGP government framework space. Um, my goal for today is to help you understand essentially how the new framework differs from the old framework and offer some help, guidance, advice uh, as you start your new business transformation OGP framework tender journey. Thanks, everyone. Excellent. Talk Thanks to you later. Very, thank you very much, Greg, and uh, a, a great, great track record to speak. So very much looking forward to your presentation a little bit. Jonathan, over to you and a bit of a bit of a background on yourself. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I suppose I'm Jonathan Dean. I'm the IT Services Director in Action Point. I work in the infrastructure side of the business. Um, I work with clients to help design you know, their IT infrastructure. Uh, with some clients, I work with their management teams to help shape IT inside their businesses. And then you know, I'm also involved in assisting in the digital transformation of clients' systems and processes. So, you know, providing a few opinions and insights on if they're redesigning an application and um, you know how uh, that might look like from an infrastructure perspective so i suppose as part of my um uh, little piece of this presentation i'm hoping to give you some take, uh, key takeaways on from some solution designs since the summer and i suppose a little bit of reflecting on the last year Excellent. And uh, Jonathan, while you have the mic, I'm going to hand over to you and you can bring us through some of the uh, tech, uh, public sector technology trends that you have seen in the past year. Perfect. I'll just ask the guys to flick off their cameras and uh, over to you, Jonathan. Perfect. Oh. Hopefully everyone is... Um, seeing a, a lovely white PowerPoint screen. You're good to go. Cool. Perfect. Um, so look, you know, uh, I won't keep you that this long. The real meat of uh, today is Greg's presentation around the OGP. Um, but I thought I might just reflect on a year gone by and hopefully give you some uh, takeaways from some of the discussions we've been having with clients over the last six months since the summer. Um, you know, uh, at the start of um, the pandemic, we um, had a big move to remote working. And we have a number of public sector clients that we work very closely with. And I suppose they were a real shining light in terms of remote work adoption. Um, probably going from behind the curve to very much ahead of the curve in many, uh, many instances. Um, You'll see from certain government research there that in 2019, nearly half of public se sector organizations employed no remote workers. And that figure has reduced to 15% since COVID, so three times growth. Um, anecdotal evidence would suggest that public sector employees are enjoying the flexibility of remote working with many employees moving away from the traditional nine to five. Um, Looking ahead, uh, there was a survey of revenue staff that was carried out in May 2020, and some 77% of respondents indicated that they favoured a combination of home and on-site working in the future. Um, remote and hybrid working will become commonplace, and Tawnish de Leo Radker wants public sector to lead by example. And the quote there is that remote working should be the norm for 20% of the public sector. Um, I suppose a couple of examples there. Um, there's a former colleague of mine uh, working with the National Transport Authority. And um, at the start of all this, they, um, they went from having no Office 365 and no Teams on Friday, the 13th of March, to having Teams rolled out and live and in use by their executive by Wednesday, the 18th, so over five days. Um, when you know push comes to shove, you can get things done very, very quickly. And um, I was qu quite impressed at the speed of that rollout. Um, we would work with a number of, I suppose, medical organizations that are funded or affiliated with the HSE. 
And, you know, inside of two weeks with one of them, we got the GPs working remotely. We got a video consultation with patients live and operating. And we got the call taking and triage staff working from home all inside of two weeks in, in an organization that would have been very much um, based around a physical location. So, it, 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 you know, when the pressure's on, good things can happen. But, you know, the, when everyone started working remotely, you know, we had the initial challenges with IT operations around delivering a remote working experience, you know, lack of equipment, taking whatever you could get, uh, using whatever tools were currently available, and just making do with it um, in any way that was uh, appropriate to get people working remotely. But uh, as, as things went on, um, as we started getting into the summer and we started realizing that, look, this is going to be going on for a very long time, some of the focus started changing to, well, we're here now, we got here, however we got here, how do we better manage all of this? You know, um, we might have little management tools available to us to control the estate of client equipment and um, tools that we've used to get people working remotely, or we could have a load of them for, you know, each vendor having their own tools and, you know, it, it just being a difficult to manage everything. So the focus started changing to, okay, how do we, how do we manage this better? How do we get a, you know, a single set of tools? How do we, you know, have a single policy? How do we control, you know, many different vendors of uh, equipment, you know? And um, so in, since the summer, there's been a lot of work around that. And then towards the end of the summer, uh, many of our clients moved into a mode of planning for the future. You know, now that um, remote working is here to stay, um, how do we, you know, optimize our processes and systems for this new way of work? And I one big uh, key takeaway around that, um, I've been I've been involved in a lot of planning sessions uh, where we've been looking at the applications that clients are using and how their users interact with their systems. And there's the overriding thing about this is how do we get people, um, you, you might have legacy applications with fat clients that require VPNs and they require good broadband connectivity to work or they require lots of Citrix or remote desktop or Horizon View um, to work properly. Um, when, when looking at these systems, um, the overriding thing here is uh, providing a fully featured, uh, easy to use, web browser based UI uh, that can be accessible anywhere without a VPN and usable on a substandard broadband connection. It can be secured with modern authentication, including MFA, but by shaping your ERP system, your CRM system, your patient administration system, your student administration system, you know, your finance system, if it's accessible through a decent browser interface. The downstream impact of this is enormous. It shapes the choice of client equipment. You might not need such weighty laptops. And um, it can have a dramatic change in the type of workload running in your data center or in your cloud, you know, less remote desktop, less Citrix, and it'll free up those resources so you can use them for analytics uh, to provide better quality information for decision making. And all of this coming down to how the user interacts with the system day one, a, a big choice. Um, but look, you know, now that everyone's working remote, the, the big concern of the day is around security. Um, Kevin Mitnick, the famous hacker, once said that it's easier to manipulate people rather than technology, and uh, nothing has stressed security more than the past 12 months. Um, poor password hygiene continues to be a big problem, and you know we still see lots of tools, applications that don't support multi-factor authentication. Um, you know, employees working from home are more likely to engage in risky security activities. They're outside of our highly secure private networks and have a bit more scope to do more things. Um, 
many organizations have already fa uh, fallen victim of phishing and that, and they don't even realize it. Um, you can even see, you know, from yesterday, the urgent notice from Microsoft for on-premise exchange servers to be patched immediately to stave off a very serious new zero-day vulnerability that's um, being exploited by a, a Chinese group. You know, when people are working remotely, you know, it provides additional vectors in to your environment. And, you know, in the rush to get people working remotely, security was often not the not the highest thing on the list, but it is something that, that has to be addressed. Um, we're also seeing, you know, um, from some of our commercial clients, uh, the kind of security audits that they're now being subjected to. Over the last 12 months, the weight of those, the amount of questions, the depth of those questions, it's, it's um, staggering the amount of effort um, uh, one of our clients, it is now taking them three times uh, longer to complete their security questionnaires for their uh, for their um, customers. It's um, it's uh, and it's only going to get worse, you know. So security is absolutely something we need to have um, on the top of the agenda. Um, digitalization, the rise of the digital citizen. So. Um, Minister of State Patrick O'Donovan uh, has have been quoted as saying, you know, we're asking all public bodies to double down on their efforts to go digital, you know, and you can see why, you know, um, it can help to avoid a complete shutdown of services during a pandemic or extreme weather events. As part of that, it's, it's important to understand the difference between digitization and digitalization, you know, digitization where you're taking your paper records or paper processes and scanning the information in. And digitalization is then changing how you go about um, your, your different processes by you know, using, your, uh, using an ERP system or using a, some kind of computerized system to do that. Um, but you can see the, the, the results of doing uh, digitalization. You know, the passport office were able to process 400,000 password passports in 2020, even during the heaviest of restrictions. 45% of them were online. And, you know, there was another spin-off in that in around Brexit where there was the increase in demand for passports. And ultimately, as resources were freed up uh, from the online system, take, taking some of the load away from some of the more paper-based manual methods, those staff could be redeployed to deal with the, ins uh, the surge of um, Brexit applications. Um, you know, agility and speed are no longer obstacles for public sector digital transformation. You know, the, the beta, the COVID tracker app was built in 10 days. And I could reference the example from the NTA and from uh, uh, the medical organization we work with, you know, um, you, you, can, you can roll things out quickly, but when, when the chips are down, um, you know, the fully functioning passport renewal system was delivered in six months. Um, I know that that had to be live uh, for Paddy's Day for the uh, ministerial visits abroad uh, back in 2017. So um, one of the other trends then is around um, where, uh, where the spend is going. So we have some figures here from the US and really there's only the, the main point out of this table, and hopefully you can see a laser pointer here, is around uh, the trend for ever increasing spends on software. Software defined, software for uh, uh, digitally transforming your processes, and you know, uh, that ultimately the, the spend on some of the more traditional items is not increasing to the same level. People are spending more on software. And that's a trend that's set to continue. And um, in, in times of adversity, people turn to software development, software systems to improve processes, increase efficiencies, uh, drive down costs. Um, and, you know, these are difficult times. It's, it's no wonder we're seeing this trend continue. Um, public sector bodies will become software enabled digital organizations. Uh, more devices and equipment will be needed by staff to support remote working. 
um, data analytics tools and expertise will be required and you know infrastructure to, to run those will be required as well. Um, a, a really big trend amongst all of our clients is around self-service. You know, how do we get users to help themselves with things like password resets? How do we get, you know, somebody who has an, you know, a car insurance renewal? How do we get them once we send them out the docs that they can help themselves and renew themselves so that there's less work for our staff to do? Um, and you know you can see it with the the rollout of my gov id and the uh, ever increasing uh, amount of services that um, are linked to that um, it's a very very handy service um, faster and more scalable infrastructure is required to support all of these you know your your workloads can be quite varied or change um, you know you might have systems that are optimized for remote desktop for Citrix for, for user experience. Um, whereas you might find that that uh, might need to be changed or the, the profile of use might need to be changed where that, that infrastructure might need to be reused now for analytics. So having scalable infrastructure, uh, flexible infrastructure is very important. So um, some takeaways around infrastructure. Yeah, so you know we had many clients who had closed private environments and that they had to become more open uh you know we had one particular client that had specifically designed their it infrastructure so that it would not be accessible remotely and over a period of weeks we had to turn that completely on its head and um, you know that, that would be a more unusual kind of deployment now and um, in order to support legacy applications and that there was a big change in the profile of workload this week to roll out more um, virtual desktop solutions, more Citrix, more remote desktop. But now as um, organizations are looking at the applications and how users interact with those applications, you know, if they can change how they'll interact, they'll require less virtual desktop. Um, and, you know, uh, those resources can be used elsewhere. Um, you know, there's increasing management complexity around infrastructure and there's heavier security requirements, you know, there, there's a lot of pressure now for automated response and that. So by having um, your infrastructure um, designed so that uh, it takes advantage of automation, you can make, uh, you can reduce your management complexity. And you know, if you you know you can configure things so that if this server needs a bit more space, if there's more, if there's sufficient space in the pool, the space is added in the background automatically, and it's just reported on, so it doesn't require somebody to have to go and do something. Uh, likewise, you know, um, you can have integrations between your um, seam and your uh, virtualized environment, so that you know if uh, there is suspicious activity that um, matches a particular profile well i want this server over here shut down you know you can have an automated response but by having a software defined infrastructure by having a an automated infrastructure it allows these things to happen um, i mentioned before about the weight of ever increasing security and regulatory compliance i mean the the, the depth in questions coming in are the depth of questions coming in and questionnaires and the quantity is just incredible um, and that's only going to get worse. And I suppose one of the challenges of when you're running on-premise infrastructure, you know, the ever-increasing demand for physical footprints because my data is growing or I, I need more compute. Um, you can put some manners on that uh, ever-increasing physical footprint by introducing, you know, converged and hyper-converged infrastructure uh, where there is ultimately less rack space going to be taken up. Um, and I suppose the final thoughts uh, from my little piece here is that um, undertaking digital transformation is hard, um, but there are plenty of professionals to help you on your journey. Um, you know, don't be afraid to ask. Um, we ourselves um, are, are on our own digital transformation journey with our own internal systems. And it's, you know, you'd think being an IT and software development company that we find it easy. It's uh, it's far from easy. <laughs> um, 
deploying a modern infrastructure solution with high levels of automation provides a sound platform for transformation. Yeah, you know, um, you, you can't be taking on board more management headache, right? but by having automation, it, it helps alleviate that. And, you know, security and usability have to be designed in from the start. Trying to retrofit security on something is, is can be extremely difficult, you know. Um, build, building security and usability in um, from the start is, is easier to accomplish with an end-to-end -end solution compared to individual silos. You know, um, if you're going and, you know, buying storage from one vendor, uh, switches from another, compute from another, firewall from another, backup from somebody else, um, all with their own management tools. If you, you know, look to the likes of Lot5 uh, to end-to-end -end solutions, well, it can all be wrapped up in a single solution with uh, hopefully a single management tool, but less management tools anyways than if you're uh, uh, running many different systems and building it yourselves. So definitely an end-to-end -end solution compared to um, uh, individual silos. Um, I suppose, look, that's, that's it for me. Um, I'm going to hand over to Greg Hoslow, who's going to go through the OGP frameworks and the lots and compare the old and the new. Thank you. Thanks very much, Thanks, Jonathan. Jonathan. Just give uh, Greg a few minutes to set up there. Uh, fascinating insights from Jonathan, and and certainly, um, you know, it's all pointing in one direction, um, and that's towards lighter, more scalable, and uh, remote managed systems. So, Greg, without further ado, over to you. Hi, Peter. Thank you. Uh, can you see my screen there? Perfect. Yep, I'm on. Okay. Go. Uh, just for everybody, um, as I said, we're, there will be an opportunity at the end for Q&A uh, panel discussion. So if you do have any questions, um, feel free to put those in via the chat and we'll look to get to answer as many of those here during the session or if we run out of time, we'll follow up with you individually on those. Um, we, will be, we also will be distributing the slides after this. So with that, I'm, I'm going to kick on and uh, hopefully all of this will be of um, benefit to you. So in order to look at what's there today, I'm going to take a very short while to have a look at the old framework uh, so we can do a compare and contrast. So the original framework came into being 2016 um, and was run for initial two years um, with two by one year extensions possible. So the maximum framework term was four years uh, and it, it ran that term. Uh, it was a multi-supplier framework uh, agreement and was designed to meet and deliver on three core IT infrastructure needs for sub public sector bodies. That is storage, server or compute. Apologies, I'm old school. I still refer to them as servers. Whereas the modern, the modern way of, of referring to it is compute. And lastly, converged infrastructure. The framework consisted of eight lots, four for storage, three for compute, and one for converged infrastructure. And finally, this framework is expired as of October of last year. If we take a, a deeper under the hood look, um, at the respective lots on the framework, we can see that the individual classification under the category. So we've got our storage category, we've got our compute store servers category, and we've got our converge category. The three lots are very much aligned. Sorry, if we take servers, so starting with servers, uh, the three lots that are in there are very much aligned with the underlying processor technology used. So if your server compute processor of choice or need was Intel or AMD, you would have went out on lot five for servers. Same with storage, with the lots again being aligned to performance, features, and network standards uh, available or supported within on that platform. 
So for example, on lot one, this was categorized or classed as carrier grade. So if you had a, a high performance compute requirement or storage performance compute or requirement with low latency, you would have been going out under on lot one for tier one storage. Um, obviously, um, in the new framework, that, that's changed, but and I'll get to that in a little while. Um, one thing of note outside of the categories and the classifications is that the framework was designed to drive competition and maximize the number of responses to SRFTs or competitions. As such, for each lot, the maximum number of places any brand could have on a lot was three. So for lot five, you would have had three Dell partners, three Dell, three Dell resellers, three Dell, including Dell itself. Um, lot one would have been the same. It was min it was max, sorry, the maximum was three. Um, and this is going to be very important when, when we get to, to talk about version two or the new, the new version of the framework. Very much a siloed approach. As you can see, you've got separate categories, lots for servers, storage, and then converged infrastructure. Taking a look at the new framework, what we can see, there's three things to note between the new and the old. The first is the number of lots is reduced. So on the new lot, we have five. On the old lot, we have eight. There are still, with regard to servers, there are still the same three server lots. But the number of storage lots has removed, has reduced to one. And finally, we have this, the converged infrastructure category has disappeared and been replaced, or there is a new server and storage category, which I'm going to talk to. And finally, it's live as of November. The new framework is live as of November of last year, 2020. Again, it is two years term with up to two one-year extensions. So the maximum term for the new framework is four years. So this framework is going to be in place until the end of 2024. Looking under the hood again on the new framework, we can now see how the framework is organized. Lots one to three for servers, lots four, a single lot, lot four for storage. And we have this new lot five covering compute and storage, which also encompasses converged and hyper-converged. So if your need is for servers and servers only, then depending on your processor of choice, you're going to go out on either lot one, two, or three. Again, with lot one being AMD Intel processor technology. If it is just storage that you're looking for, you're going to go out on lot four and lot four only. No having to work out again, as it's a single lot, so they've reduced the number of lots on the storage category from four to one. So there's no having to work out, is it lot, is it tier one, tier two, tier three, or NAS. If your requirement is storage, you're going to go out on lot four. However, one of the key issues, again, with the old framework, was that there was no mechanism to run a single mini competition for both servers and storage. So if I was looking to refresh my SAN setup, I would have to run a mini competition for servers and then run a separate mini competition for storage. Equally, I may need uh, a separate mini competition for switching, uh, and I may then have to access other frameworks uh, or other drawdown facilities around licensing, etc. This piecemeal siloed approach meant more work and more delay in the time to solution delivery for you. So being able to go to the market on lot five using a single competition, a single tender, and to procure both compute and storage as part of that tender, as, or as part of that competition, is, is a dramatic sea change over the old approach, the old piecemeal siloed approach, as I've said. Equally, 
and to Jonathan's earlier presentation, the market has spoken and the trend is firmly towards con convergence type solution. The ability to be able to shrink the number of systems that need to be managed and maintained, the number of point products and panes of glasses that I need to reference or, or visit to understand what exactly is going on, the status of my end-to-end -end environment or the status of the environment that I'm interested in and what actions I need to take. Inbuilt intelligence and automation as delivered with converged and hyper-converged solutions helps reduce the time required for day-to-day -day management, freeing up the time for systems administrators and IT execs to focus on those value-add activities and strategic business modernization and transformation initiatives, which Jonathan spoke about earlier, and bec are becoming more and more um, off, the, off the function of the IT. The business is no longer looking to IT just to deliver technical services. They're looking for them to drive and facilitate business enhancing transformational projects and initiatives. Plus you have the assurance that with your, so, so with hyper-converged and converged, being able to, to size the environment for what you need today in the knowledge that should you need it, you can grow that environment uh, as required going forward is of great assurance. So no longer do you have to un basically try to work out, look into that crystal ball uh, as to, you know, what am I going to need or what, what are my requirements for storage and compute likely to be in the next five, in five years time. Um, now with hyperconverged to converge, it, it's possible just to, based on the range and the array of solutions and options that are out there, you can basically simply size the solution to meet the needs of today and you you confident in the knowledge that should you need it, you can add to that in a cost-effective and efficient manager, man, man, manner without uh, having to consider or, uh, forklift up, upgrades or uplifts or upgrades. Back in 20, back in 2020, back in 2016, converged and hyper-converged technology was in its infancy. There was only a handful of vendors offering the options Offer. There was only a handful of vendor option, offerings. The options available were limited. Market adoption in the public sector was low, non-existent, and there was a perception that this technology was expensive. Fast forward to today, and it's like night and day. The range of converged, hyper-converged solutions available and the subsequent customer adoption and market appetite for converged and hyper-converged solutions has exploded. Several instances now exist in the public sector space. Hence, and over the lifetime of this framework, we believe that the vast majority of public sector tenders or tenders will be going out on lot five because that offers a more solution typed, uh, solution orientated um, option for you and path for you as you, as you look to modernize and transform uh, the business, the, your business environments. Some additional information as well. So as well as that, now that we have this new server and storage lot, where you can procure both servers and storage under a single tender, under a single mini competition, there's some additional information and some additional changes. The range of ancillary equipment that you can now procure under this new framework, this new version of the framework has been expanded and extended. So now you can, you can also, at the point of tender, you can include the likes of sand switching, load balancers, racks, cabinets, disks, UPS devices, KVMs. You can even procure backup target, backup target hardware and licensing as part of this new framework on lots four and five. Software licensing as well. Now, the OGP have been, I suppose, uh, diligent to ensure 
that the software licensing that's going to be or that is available and can be procured uh, under an individual or, or a single competition or tender that that software license is very much aligned to the to the actual solution that you're tendering for or you're going to market so again if it, if it's backup software that you're including as part of the tender backup target hardware and software then the software licensing of that must only be applicable to that part of the solution or that part of the backup infrastructure that is being tendered for under that or under that competition so it's not possible to go off and renew and uh, upgrade all of your other existing licensing that may that you may already have in place there are as i said existing uh, frameworks and drawdown facilities around that. One of the other things that, that's here in the new framework is that you can, as with the old, you can procure warranty and support services via mini competition across all of the lots. So if you have servers that are coming up for renewal uh, in terms of warranty, you can use the OGP framework for that. You can go out on the OGP framework for the warranty and support element of it only. One thing to note as well with regard um, lots four and five include backup target hardware. So as well as your primary hardware and your primary your primary storage hardware, you can also procure your backup target hardware as part of part of a store lot four or lot five mini competition. And finally, converged infrastructure also includes hyperconverged devices as per lot five. So when we talk about converged, we're also talking about uh, lot hyper-converged. I'm not going to spend too much on this because I've spoken predominantly around it on these. So some of the key takeaways from the new, the new framework and the new, uh, uh, and the new setup. Ultimately, we have a new compute and storage lot. As I said, you can now go out to tender for both compute and storage in a single competition, in a single mini competition. There's a broader workload delivery focus. It's more solution orientated. It's not piecemeal, it's not siloed. I don't have to consider separate competitions for servers and then for storage, for my switching, for my licensing, for my backup target hardware, for my UPSs. I'm now able under a single competition or mini competition, I'm able to go to market for an end-to-end -end solution, for a single solution to meet the business need, which ultimately is reducing and significantly reducing the time to solution. If you look at the old framework, as again, having to go out on separate competitions for servers and storage, that increased the amount of time it took from initial draft SRFT and getting that published to actually the award and getting that solution in place so that the, the business could leverage and, and benefit from that new, new technology and new, and new solution. Equally as well, the time. So in terms of the tiering and the classification, under the old framework, all of the lots were classified as tier five. Uh, which meant there was essentially the guidance from uh, the OGP was that it was a six month lead time from initial SRFT to ultimate award of the award of the, of the, the competition award of the, the tender. With the new framework, that's gone from six months. So they've reduced the tiering. And again, a lot of this is knowledge and familiarity and standardization they've reduced the time to 10 weeks. So literally, if you're going to the, S to the OGP with a draft SRFT, they're basically saying that it would take, you should expect it to take 10 weeks or less for you to get to the point of where you're, you're awarding that, you're awarding that, that tender. Um, that's significant, that's over 50% reduction in the time to solution. Equally, um, if we take that from the point of view of the new being able to combine or merge compute and storage with all of the ancillary equipment and services therein, 
you're looking at a significant reduction in the time to solution using the new framework as against what was available to you under the, the old framework. I'm nearly there now, so, so thank you for, for, for bearing with me on it. Um, so some additional information for yourselves. There's a huge wealth, as Jonathan said there, obviously there's a huge amount of professionals out there to help and assist. And our door is always open. This, this is a, a significant public sector, significant piece uh, of our business, our business model going forward. So our door is always open. Don't be afraid. If you need help, if you need guidance, if you need advice, we can come in, we can, we can assist with some of the, the sizing. Uh, obviously, we have to be you know, careful what we do so we don't preclude ourselves from actually the competition, but we can advise and guide. But on top of that, there is a huge wealth of information in the background. The OGP website, there's the secure buyer assets. So there's a secure buyer section. So all of the templates, um, all of the financial return templates that you need, uh, SRFT templates, um, you know, any of the um, financial analysis as well, all of that is there for you and that's available equally. There's the e-tender website. Going back to 2016, every tender that's been released via the OGP or e-tenders, those are available to you on the on e-tenders. The e so if you know somebody, you can go in there, you can search, you can reference, you can reference existing tenders, you can even reference, you can see who the contract was awarded to, you can see the contract amount. So it'll give you an idea as in terms of budgeting, you can see who actually participated in that. Um, so there's a huge wealth and, and depth of information available to you because like anything else, and this is guidelines from the OGP, before you start, you need to have your homework done. The more homework and the better prepared you are when you go to approach the ESSER, go to approach the OGP, the longer, it, or the, 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 the less time it's going to take to get that to cut pub, that tender published and ultimately you in a position to award. So there's a couple of things that are there. Um, obviously, budget. You need to you need to have a budget and, and approval within the organization. You need to also know what you need, not necessarily what you want. And we can help with that. We can help you guide and advise. Uh, we have tools. We have we have solutions there that we can we can use to help you to determine what you need and define that. You need to have done your homework. You need to have done your market research, ultimately, so that you know what you're going to. You know that there are available solutions there out in the market. You're not running you're not running a competition where there's only one company that one company or one partner or one vendor. Who can who can reply? And lastly, do you have the internal resources? You need an evaluation team, so you need to have those available so that you can continue. You've got the resources and the time are there to progress the competition and get you to the point of where you're publishing your tender and ultimately getting closer and to being able in a position to award that. Finally, um, as I said, we're here to help. Don't be afraid to reach out. Uh, we've got our, our public sector at Action Point email address there. Uh, obviously, we'll be uh, sharing the, the, the deck, uh, the slides after the event. Uh, so our contact details will be on there. As I said, if you've, got, if you've got a question, if there's anything you need, if we can help, don't be afraid to ask. That's what we're here for. Thank you very much, everyone. Great stuff, Greg, and thank you very much. Uh, very informative and enlightening uh, presentation, and I hope uh, people have clarity now um, on, I suppose, not just the changes, but the great opportunity that, that that's up ahead with this new Lot 5 in the OGP framework. So very, very interesting. Um, I'm going to ask um, all our panelists to come back on. Um, I know we're slightly behind on schedule, everybody, but if you could delay the lunches uh, a couple of minutes and um, we, we, we'll get some Q&A. And I'm really, really curious to hear about Ross's 
uh, insights are, and, and, and also Jonathan and Greg's as well. So please do get your questions in. Um, there's a little questions to have there in your go to webinar dashboard. Um, we'll be here for as long as you want us to be, but we don't want to take too long either. Um, Ross, I'm going to start with you. Um, I suppose you're, you're a special guest yeah. today. Like, what are the key, I suppose, observations you're on the ground when it comes to procurement in the public sector? I suppose, well, procurement, as I look back, I suppose, at 2020, um, there's a few standouts from last year. I suppose one main thing that why we saw was the demise of the humble PC was premature, to say the least. I think everyone on the call can probably attest to how difficult it was to get their hands on PCs last year. I suppose from a, a Dell perspective, we shipped over 56 million PCs last year. So for something like nearly two a second or something like that, and it equates to about 56% market share in Ireland, that is. Um, uh, I suppose a lot of people also said there was a lot of shortages globally uh, last year. And, and I was going to say 56 million wasn't enough. <laughs> 56 million wasn't enough. <laughs> so I think the long lead times initially last year, obviously, were just down to factory closures and, and then in, in Asia and um, SSD shortages in Thailand where most of them are made and we would have seen that on the server side as well and then it just led to there was logistics problems and airport closures factory closures it all sort of manifested into a bit of a perfect it was a real yeah, year. it was a real scramble Russ um, oh, I guess, and oh 100% yeah and look we were all we look it, it happened to us all whether you were the organization on the ground or supplier or the IT partner um and and even down to peripherals like mice and headsets and and, and all that stuff oh, as well. yeah, headsets were like hands teeth yeah yeah it yeah still are. I think yeah. um ju just on that point like we, we went through the initial scramble phase, which was the first probably two, three, four months. Then we got settled. Um, what happened then? Like we, we got settled, we got into our we got into our mojo a little bit of remote working, um, and we kind of got used to it. I guess what were the what were the challenges then that you saw towards the latter half, maybe, or the the, the fourth yeah, quarter so, of last year? Yeah, we're seeing that sort of manifest itself more now. Um, like so, all that demand. Uh, for, for notebooks for remote work and led to a challenge for IT departments and how to deploy and image them initially, right? So that was the initial problems for, for IT. So how am I going to actually get those uh, notebooks um, and uh, um, monitors, et cetera, into the hands of the end users, right? So th that was the initial problem, right? Um, and now what we're seeing is because of this, there's such disparate buying, everyone was just scrambling, as you say, just to try and get their hands on devices. but. Um, like we've got guys from the pub, private sector side of the house who's, they were sending guys down to Harvey Norman with um, uh, credit cards to just buy any device. So what you have now on the ground is guys with Tosh Jiba laptops, Lenovo, it's, a, it's securing and managing that estate now has become, that's what we're now seeing is, seems to be the problem. So like, you know, you've got people that have bought, you, you know, devices with Pentium and Celeron processors, for example, like Teams doesn't really work on that. You know, Zoom backgrounds don't work on Celeron processors. So you've got now a, a whole other set of issues for IT is, is, is now looking at this sort of hybrid worker era. And like that's getting the right device to the, with the right spec into the hands of the right worker in the right location. So we take a sort of approach internally of a personas based approach for that. And it's, it's something that um you know it would need to start looking at it's not just giving it and it's not a one-size-fits-all approach i suppose and i think it's i think it's something that can be secured and managed correctly into the hands of of that hybrid worker as we call it yeah no it's a good point i think it's stuff johnson touched on as well um i have a message i have a question in here from sean it's for you greg um uh, greg mentioned the backup target uh, being a hardware device what if you want your final backup destination to be somewhere in the cloud, uh, does the framework facilitate that scenario? Um, not an easy one. <laughs> not an easy one. Okay, probably needs further. Further, it depends. Right, I'm going to use yeah. a John. One of Jonathan. It depends, but ultimately, cloud services and the consumption are not encompassed as part, are not covered. So there are two exceptions to the framework. Um, managed services, which typically are uh, after point of sale um, so that's what you're talking about there so they're not covered uh, within the framework um, and cloud services so whilst the the OGP when they were putting the framework together 
they insisted, um, you know, because there was a huge qualification and due diligence. So not only have all of the players on the framework been vetted and gone through a, a strict vetting process, all of the technologies and all of the solutions on the framework have also gone through the same, the same vetting and due diligence to ensure that they're fit for purpose for the public sector. Because the danger with any of this is when you go out to tender, you can either be too prescriptive or under not prescriptive enough, such that you end up with a pig in a poke um, yeah. and not what you wanted. So cloud services, whilst all of the solutions that would have been there should facilitate cloud readiness, yeah. cloud services per se are not included under under the, the current framework or this framework. I think the advice for Sean might be just to maybe catch up offline and, and yeah, maybe have absolutely. a conversation. There, there, there's a lot of nuances in this one and um, I, I, I think planning is key. Um, I'm just gonna pop up a poll guys. I'm gonna indulge a little bit more time. Um, I, I just think it, it's interesting if we look at um, uh, across, the, across the board what's happening. Um, so the question was when Sean is next planning on going to tender uh 13 percent are current in tendering process the largest chunk there 44 percent in the next one to three months um maybe can you talk to that uh scenario jonathan or greg about you know what should you be doing if you're if you're out to tender so soon like what are the what are the what are the considerations what are the observations what do we need to be doing in in in, in that zone I would have like what like what I said there. My advice would be um, engage. Don't be afraid to pick up the phone. Um, we're here to help. So get as much help as you can. Obviously, there are organisations out there who are self-sufficient and autonomous. They know exactly what they have and exactly what they need and exactly where they're going. But like that, it's important when you come to the frameworks that. Um, you get what you need. If you know what you need, that, that ultimately what, what is awarded or gets awarded under the framework uh, and under the tender process is exactly what you need. So it's fit, it's fit for purpose and right-sized to your needs. Um, so that, that's what I would say. But homework, market research is key, as well as making sure you've got budget. So you've, you know how much it's going to cost you or, gen, or broad, broadly what it's going to cost you. And two, you've got a team there to support that tender process. So to, there will be, and history and experience and feedback would say, there will be over and back with the OGP. They do, you know, they are procurement specialists and that is their job. They are overseers, they're oversight in terms of the framework and everything that happens there uh, on the framework. So they will be involved. They will ask questions, they will look for stuff. So you need a team there. Otherwise, what's going to happen is you're going to hit roadblocks and delays. And as I said, all it's going to do is slow things down. You're going to end up not getting the solution you need or you're looking for when you need it or as quickly as you need it. Yeah, yeah so. to kind of echo what Greg has said there is I suppose we would have seen plenty of tenders that were very, very light on detail. And where they're light on detail, that leads to an awful amount of questions. And, you know, it's like the work can't be avoided. Uh, it either yeah. is in the tender doc to begin with, or you'll be inundated with questions. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, so I think the advice is really to start planning, start thinking, start, uh, I suppose, you know, get the get the whiteboard out. What are we looking for here? And I, I think there's an element, you, you just got to start, we, got, we have to start looking ahead. I, I think COVID's been a massive reset. I think we have to start planning ahead for for the future of of our public service and and the the service delivery that we're hoping to do. Um, so look, um, very interesting webinar, guys. I um, would love to stay a bit longer on the Q and A, um, but we've, we've gone a bit over time. But I, I think it was worth it. I, I think there's a lot of very very useful information there, and I'm hoping uh, I'm hoping our audience uh, think the same. Um, we have a little survey just after this, so please do um, please do fill that out and give us any feedback. And um, we're keen to run a few more of these events, public sector focused. So um, we, we'd love to know uh, what you require from us. Um, the final piece then is um, uh, I suppose uh, mark the calendars um, for March 31st. Um, we will be running a data center of the future 
event um, with a focus on hyper-converged and, and, and modern storage. Um, so uh, a couple of the people on this call will be joining me for that webinar. Um, we'll have an invite sent out hopefully with the with the uh, webinar follow-up email. Um, so keep an eye out for that. Um, that's a that's a cross-sector event. Um, but we'll hopefully be able to drive some decisions around your tender process if that is indeed coming up. Um, yeah, I suppose lastly, I'd like to thank all my speakers, uh, Jonathan, Greg, and Ross. Um, I'd like to thank our yep. partner, Dell, Dell Technologies, um, who's uh, sponsors today's event, and we've collaborated on, on events in the past. And um, I suppose from, from me, thanks many for everyone for tuning in, and uh, enjoy your Thursday afternoon. Take care. Cheers. Thanks, guys. Good luck. <laughs>